بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear participant, welcome to one of Nasija Academy series of webinar that aim to share knowledge, ideas, and reflections on hot topics, new trends, and rapid technology in the fields of learning, information, knowledge management, and digital transformation. Today's webinar will be about test fraud prevention and on-the-job assessment for organizations. No doubt, test fraud prevention is a vital component of modern evaluation practices, as it helps organizations maintain fair and reliable assessment processes, identify qualified candidates, and make informed decisions about individual suitability for specific role and responsibility. Test fraud prevention involves implementing measures and strategies to identify and discourage fraudulent behavior during test-taking processes. This can include action like verifying, and, and, uh, verifying the identity of test taker, monitoring test sessions for any suspicious activity, or cheating attempt, attempt and utilizing advanced technology to detect plagiarism or unauthorized assist. By actively competing test fraud, organization can uphold the integrity and validity of their assessment results, ensuring a fair playing field for all candidates and staff. To talk in deep about this topic, I am delighted to introduce to you our honored guest, Chelsea Dowell, International Strategist Partner Manager at Western Mark, which uh, located in London with global war experience, including China, Brazil, and UAE. Chelsea has extensive <clears throat> experience with question mark, including signing up new international clients and onboarding supporting global partners. She focuses on supporting institutions globally from a variety of sectors, such as education, government, manufacturing, and utilizing to deliver valid, reliable, and uh, uh, defensible assessment. We are happy that this is the second time we have Chelsea with us, as she gave a webinar before through Nasija Academy window. I guess it was one year ago on October 2022, I guess, right, Chelsea? And it was uh, about assessment. Uh, through the learning, uh, I think uh, this will be a very good uh, opportunity to have her again, and she will uh, join us uh, on another uh, webinar in the future. And before I give uh, the virtual floor to uh, you, Chelsea, I would just try to draw the attention of our guests to uh, postpone their question and answer uh, to the end of the presentation and they can write it on the box and uh, on the question uh, and answer box. So uh, Chelsea will uh, answer it at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chelsea, again for uh, being with us and we all uh, waiting uh, to uh, listen to your uh, reflection on this topic. Please go ahead, Chelsea. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, it's really great to be back. We had a great audience last year, so I'm very excited to present today. And welcome, hello, I'm joining from London. And thank you so much for everyone's patience. And as, as mentioned, I'm going to be discussing test fraud prevention and job assessments, as well as explain other assessments and how to prevent test fraud. So in terms of what we'll specifically, we are going to look at the role and the value that assessments play in organizations, in educational institutes, and also the pro of how to understand or generate good and valid assessments. We are also going to discuss how assessments support all industries. And we're going to give you some great use cases and examples of clients around globe that are using, uh, for example, question mark to generate assessments for employees, for students, etc. I'm also going to highlight the types of assessments that 
one may partake upon and also discuss some examples of of different types of assessments that can be generated within the workplace or within an academic institution. We're also going to dig deep on the test fraud risks and how to respond to those as an organization. Of course, test fraud can mean cheating in a variety of different methods to dig into those different and how to prevent. We're also going to discuss assessments and how the process is brought about and how to create valid assessment and also most importantly how to report on assessment, how to create data driven results and how to on and let's say conduct data driven decision making. And with that, I just to formally introduce myself. I am the International Strategic Partner Manager at Question Mark. Question Mark is a an online organization that specializes in assessments in around 40 years now. And personally I've been with Question five years and initiative globally when it comes to creating their assessment programs and essentially within the the question mark organization you can create assessments in the form of tests exams quiz surveys and we serve a variety of different industries which is why i'm very excited to share some of the use cases with you today but essentially, we serve corporate organizations, professional associations, government, academic institutions to help prove knowledge, skills, abilities and competence of individuals. We are trusted by the largest organizations, some of the largest organizations globally, uh, let's say within the UK, the USA, Saudi Arabia the UAE each honestly we really cover the globe and we are active in 51 countries which is a, a very proud point and we believe that every assessment pros program is unique and has to be built specifically um, and designed in a matter of intense specifications for individuals and we're going to go into that in more detail in a moment so firstly let's look at the role and value and the process of good assessments and we will discuss what makes a, a good assessment and show you some ways that uh, assessments can be created. So here we have the ability on making decisions as a result of providing assessments. So assessments really do help make decisions and they help make data driven decisions, which is most important and which is key because you're able to formally make uh, decisions with onboarding specific staff members or administering specific students. So let's say you can be supported in employee new hires, uh, you can promote people, you can also identify leadership qualities for upskilling of staff, you can also validate training courses and this is a really key one because we that learning has taken place and that the training has been attained and that employees are fully competent. So having an assessment at the end of that learning journey is really important to help prove that the, the knowledge has been attained. And also with regards to the forgetting curve, for example, it is really important to take continuous testing to mean that knowledge is continuously attained and reinstilled within an individual. 
You can also use assessments to recognize emerging skills, um, uh, skills gaps, and understand where individuals need to focus on, which topics they need to upskill on, you know, what are their strengths and weaknesses. And then that means that institutions or organizations are able to tailor their training accordingly so they can, you know, be able to on specific topics in future training programs and which ones to dig into further. It can also be very helpful in verifying regulatory compliance requirements. So in high stakes industries, it's very important to know that staff members are fully up to date with any laws and regulations. But it can also help with an organization to prove that they are compliant with specific laws and regulations. So also a great way to ensure the necessary skills is met within your team or your employees. It's also a great way to prove the learning journey for students at the end of a semester or at the end of a course to prove that they are fully competent and certified within that course. And there are many more uh, different ways in which assessments can help within organizations. Before we dig into the main portion of the webinar today, I wanted to start by asking a, a quick poll. We're going to start off with a, a light and easy poll. So I'm going to ask all of you, have any of you in the audience taken an online assessment, an online exam before? Have you taken a survey? So if we just go back and re relaunch the poll one second. There we go. So have you taken an online test or exam before? Yes or no? I'll just give you a few moments to answer. This may have been with work or at an academic institution, university. I'll just give a few moments for everyone to answer. I can tell that uh, Corona makes it uh, very uh, accessible and uh, reachable by many uh, students and uh, attendees. Yes, and that's a great point to notice as well and highlight upon that because of uh, COVID and everybody being able to study or work from home, there's definitely been a need to, to test online. Mm -hmm. So we'll just give a few more minutes. We have a few more seconds. We have a few last minute results here. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and end this first poll and let's see what we what we have. So as expected, over 77 percent of the audience has taken an online test or exam before. And this is really uh, key. Uh, to note because it shows how prevalent they are in today's uh, in everybody's day-to-day -day life. Um, this can be with, you know, your organization. It may be an exam that you have to take at university or that you've taken as part of a course line. But it's great to see the amount of people that have, you know, had experience with an online test or exam because they're very, it's a very hot topic right now, how organizations can conduct online exams. And also, if they are fair and how many people, you know, would try to cheat in those exams. And that's all things we'll dig into today. What a sensitive question will become. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So the, the next part that we're going to do is really explaining how assessment help specific industries, so how assessments are utilized for organization, etc. So the first thing to note is the corporate training aspect of assessments. And the ability for organizations to 
conduct tests as part of a training course as a pre -site. And the ability in a organization, or whether it be in a retail organization, for example, making sure employees know how to accurately sell products, you know, accurately stock shelves, or even in customer service, you know, accurately how to speak to, to customers, how to sell specific um, claims, etc. So lots of lots of opportunities within corporate training to be able to have a test the training courses. Pretty pretty obvious within the types of uh, institutions or organisations that this would be. But as I mentioned, yes, sales, retail, um, and then the main use case also is compliance and regulation. So this is a very important aspect to assistance because compliance and regulation is really important to be able to document and to prove the knowledge or skills of employees. For example, let's think of high stakes scenarios are really important for employees to prove they are job ready. For example, in aviation, we need pilots to be fully tested and to prove that they are up to date with regulations regarding to aircrafts. Another example is within pharmaceutical organizations. We need to make sure the sales staff are fully knowledgeable and compliant with any medicines that they or even for manufacturing when they are creating these medicines that they are up to scratch with dosages and and everything that goes into creating medicine also think of other transport organizations like taxi companies we need to make sure that taxi drivers are fully up to scratch with their regions and where they are navigating passengers lots of different uh Another one would be within the oil and gas industry. It's really important for engineers to operate specific machinery to make sure that they are safe when they are out, for example, in the field, that they know how to shut down machinery, recollect. And for example, within a, a gas organization, they know how to fit specific gas pipes. They know how to detach. Lots of different, really important to make sure that employees are fully up to scratch with their job role. Certification is also a very interesting, uh, let's say, which has became a really hot topic recently. After the covid situation that we've all gone through we did become a an employees market and essentially people could look for new jobs people could have access to other jobs that they were not able to do before because they're able to be remote and certification and generating your own skill set is really important and the Ability to, for example, up upskill yourself, etc., is is super important. So, for example, I take certification. I can prove that I have necessary skills in specific things. Like, if I wanted to join an IT organization, I can prove I am knowledgeable in, um, you know, Java, Python, etc. And this is most active, as I mentioned, with IT. For example, we work with uh, SAP software organizations and they use question mark to be able to conduct their certification program for internal employees and external employees. And you would take a question mark assessment and then be given a, a certificate, which you can then add to your LinkedIn, which is you know, really exciting for people to their skill set. The, the next portion is 
to cover the fact that we also deal with government, that government organizations regularly need to test the, um, for example, we personally work with the US Navy, the US Army, um, we work with Her Majesty's Friends in the UK, and we also work with the Australian and Saudi government. And it can be for a variety of reasons. It can be testing employees, but it could also be, for example, testing organizations for citizen assessments when you're trying to apply for citizenship of a specific country. Lots of different examples there. Learning and development, similar to corporate training, is really to do with the job readiness and upskilling of individuals. It's really important that you're able to measure the competency and essentially be able to prove the competency with an assessment. And education speaks for itself. Students take quizzes throughout the course to prove that they are attaining knowledge, but also to take a test end of that course to prove whether they are passed or failed and whether they can move on to a consecutive year. So this is high level, some of the industries that we work with, but also some of the industries that need assessments and where assessments are very important in their day-to-day -day projects. Now, specifically in terms of cases, we mentioned the, the way in which you can use them, like in training. But now I want to dig into specific organizations It might need this. For example, we have manufacturing. This is whereby there can be specific organizations that need to manufacture products. And they need to make sure that their employees are fully up to scratch with how to create such products, how to navigate the um, conveyor belt or machinery that goes into that. Oil and gas, as I mentioned, this can be specific to water organizations. So for example, we work with saline water. It can also be gas organizations. We work with Southwest Gas in the US who test their employees to be able to make sure that they, like I mentioned, are able to fit gas pipes and they have to take regular level knowledge level checks to make sure they are fully competent. Pharmaceutical is a real key one. We work with a lot of large pharmaceutical organizations like AstraZeneca and we also work in the US with the National League for Learning that uses us for testing. And along with pharmaceutical and healthcare, question marks specifically are really expanding our functionality for NCLEX exams to to serve the wider healthcare community. And then we have information technology. I previously mentioned to you SAP, but we work with a lot of other organizations like BCS, the British Computer Society in the UK that uses for certifications. QuickBase software company that uses us internally for uh, checking the knowledge of employees and also NTWare, which is you know, a situation where employees need to prove their competency of specific sorry, competency of specific um, practices, etc. We then also have financial services. Now, this is a huge one because think of banks, it's highly regulated. It's very important that you are handling, you know, client data, data correctly. We work with Sam and AXA Insurance to be able to test their internal employees to make sure they are conducting their job in an appropriate manner. And then transportation, this is a really exciting one because you can think about all of the aviation practices. We work with Qantas, Scoot Air, Jet2, a lot of civil aviation authorities as well that regulate most airlines globally. So we work with aviation authorities in South Africa, Australia, UAE, all over the globe. And Education, of course, is a very key one. We work with, for example, 
the Armed Forces College of Medicine in Egypt to be able to make sure all of the learning has taken place and that they can correctly certify the cadets, etc., in the correct manner so that they can then proceed to go out into the field. We also work with, um, for example, KAU, IAU, lots of universities specifically in Saudi to be able to measure the abilities of students and prove that they are up to scratch with specific courses, whether it be across multiple faculties, faculty of medicine, business department, faculty of mathematics, etc. Some more individual use cases. We specifically have an insurance organization, uh, Sanlam, that we work with for enterprise training. So they basically need to train customer service and sales staff, as well as accounting and HR. They need to conduct regular knowledge checks to make sure they understand processes and internal policies. They needed to use question mark and integrate question mark with an LMS. Now, I also want to enhance upon the LMS functionality because a lot of organizations need LMS learning management systems, for example, Blackboard, Moodle, Medad, um, Canvas. There are lots of LMS out there that question mark integrates with to be able to create a high stakes assessment tool. And this organization specifically needed flexible authoring for multiple employees to be able to create questions. So we have over 50 question types, but most important feedback. So when you take a test, you want to understand how well you've con conducted, you know, how we improved, what did we get wrong? So this is really important for employees to be able to see feedback at the end of an assessment. So they needed to, of course, enhance upon LMS functionality they wanted to pre-assess before a training course, kind of like a self-assessment to understand the level of knowledge before the training has taken place, and then conduct formative assessments with multimedia, like pictures and videos, to keep it interactive for candidates, and then take a test after the training to the proficiency and make sure that the learning experience has been adapted. So that's one successful example of an insurance organization using us for knowledge checks and processes and policies. We also have an IT use case where certifications are a need for their technical needs and their technical staff, technical support, whereby they conduct product trainings and then have to have an exam to prove that they are skilled in implementing specific solutions for clients that they can sell specific solutions to clients and they can take multiple certifications and have up to 11 um, let's say digital badges to prove competency and then again like you'll see with most of these use cases that i'm sharing there is a heavy integration with MS because of course learning is heavily remote at the moment and there is a need for content to be consumed online. So learning management systems or learning experience platforms are a very um, required functionality within most organizations and schools. There is also a need with this organization for proctoring, which we'll cover in a bit of detail later, but proctoring is a way for them to be able to test all of their employees remote. And this is really good because it saved this organization money so that they didn't have to pay for employees to go to test centers. They are able to take tests within their own home to save travel and time. And the challenge with some organizations that need an assessment platform is they need a robust assessment where they can mitigate cheating and you know they also need to provide badges to be able to prove employee ranking etc and they were really making use of the reporting which i'm going to highlight at the end of the webinar the real importance of what reports can be generated from assessments and why do we need to report on assessments it's 
cases as well as organizations uh, globally. So specifically, this was for learning and development to make sure engineers are up to scratch with safety training and field training so they are job ready. So this would be, for example, um, in refineries, etc. And they had an observational assessment capability, which I will be going into more detail shortly to explain how observational activities work, how you can uh, utilize them and how to actually conduct them to begin with. And as you can see here, they needed integration with an LMS and also the ability to be able to deliver those observational tests which is essentially the need to test people live and in person. So as I mentioned observational assessments, it's time to dig into the different types of assessments that you may take or that you can generate as an organization. Lots of different types here. So of course, you can have a formative or summative assessment, you know, formative being the more frequent testing and summative being the the general assessment that you would get at the end of a course to summarize the entire learning. Workplace assessments, this could be for pre post hire to prove job readiness, could also be observational. You may also need to take quizzes and surveys. There's also a job task analysis, which I'll dig into in more detail. But job task analysis essentially is being able to understand the tasks that would be needed in an organization and how frequent and how difficult those tasks are. You also on the other side have certifications. Certifications, as I mentioned, are really important. Nowadays, it's such a hot topic. Everybody is trying to be certified or upskill themselves. Regulatory exams, as I mentioned, organizations also may need to test Kirkpatrick levels one, two and three. It can also be within healthcare, you know, credentialing, placement tests or administration tests, and then, of course, diagnostic as well. So lots of different types of assessments floating about. Let's dig into some key examples. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick poll and I'm going to ask all of you, for example, which of the following is not a type of test and exam? So I just mentioned a, a few assessment types like um, survey, certification, et cetera. And which of these is not a type of exam? So which is not an assessment? We'll just give you all a few moments to vote there. Which of the below is not an assessment? So which of these have I not mentioned? So we have here is observational an assessment? Is job task analysis a type of assessment? Is certification a type of assessment? or is reading a leaflet a type of assessment? Which of these have I not been speaking about? So we'll just give everyone a few more moments to vote. Maybe the word, yeah, the word not is just a little bit tricky. So uh, someone's just uh, not figured it out. Yes, yes, definitely. Which is not an assessment, which is not an example of taking a test, which would not which would not prove my knowledge, shall we say. Perfect, so we'll just give a few more moments, last few votes. And we're gonna go ahead and end the poll now and let's review some of the answers. Perfect. So if we go ahead and look at these results, let's see what we have. So the majority, 43% of voters were correct 
reading a leaflet or a textbook is not a exam or example of a test. So we can see there's a few queries with regards to observational and job task analysis and certification, but that's okay because in my next few slides, I'm going to be talking specifically about what an observational assessment is and what a job task analysis process is and also what certifications entail. So well done to the majority of you for getting that correct. Now we're going to dig into other types of assessments and explain these in more detail to clarify anything. So next, we have the types of assessments with regards to severity. Now, what we mean by severity, this relates to the security requirements that would be needed. And that relates to the potential cheating that could take place and whether or not cheating would impact someone's scores. So first, we have a survey. Now, obviously, in a survey, this is all to do with opinions. So you can't really copy someone's opinion. It's very much um, a thought gathering exercise. We also have uh, quizzes on the lowest set scale of things. And quizzes are just more open book, lighthearted assessments that don't usually result in a specific qualification. Then we have job task analysis, which is also on the survey side of things. It's really about rating the importance and frequency of tasks. Then we have observational assessments, which needs to be taken place in a secure manner because someone, a monitor, needs to be watching the candidate whilst they're conducting a specific task. So it needs to be in a secure environment, maybe an exam hall, et cetera. And then high stakes exams, like the exams that you take at the end of a semester at university, et cetera, they are very high stakes, there are a lot on the line. So if people cheat, this can be bad uh, because they wouldn't have the correct knowledge to be able to graduate, for example. into the stakes. So why are assessments needed and why are they important? It all comes down to the stakes and the results if an assessment is not conducted. So let's think of any organization where life, limb, and livelihood is on the line. Now this can be related to aviation, if a pilot is not accurately upskilled and does not know how to fly incorrectly, it can end very badly, dangerous. Similarly, if you're operating a, a crane and you need to be able to know how to work because there are many people on there, if you don't know how to do that and you do something incorrect, it can end very badly in accident or also, if you are taking train lines, etc., and you are not something properly, and it could result in a train crash, for example, this is very bad for the risk of accidents. You can also think, as I have said, banks. Banks are at risk fined or getting into if, for example, employees aren't fully skilled with how they are quoting their customers, and if they miss sell a specific policy, this can be very bad and can result in fines of millions, and as you can see on the screen here, billions of pounds or dollars, etc. And this would then also reputation. Now, reputation is so important because I myself would not sign up to a bank if I knew that they had sold their customers. So it's the future of those organizations as well. As you can also see, for example, um, 
universities have been fined millions for how the labs and the labs basically manage chemical waste or how they are using academic property correctly. So we need in order to make sure everybody is competent. And it's really important and it's such a hot topic because there is really high stakes involved. The risk of accidents, injury, fines, suits, many things here for organization, but also for individuals as well, individuals' lives. So this is a, a slide to really show the importance of why they are needed in multiple industries. Then after, after all of this, we have the, the lower stakes, shall we say, assessments, workplace assessments that can be from HR organization. So we have pre and post hiring which can then help organizations or HR teams to make data-driven decisions. So for example, a HR decision is made dependent on the assessment outcome. You know, do you hire someone? Do you promote someone? Or do you fire someone? So tests can be very important in the HR process. And also that can then impact a person's employment conditions. So really important that the assessment is and valid and reliable. Another point about the hiring, but it can also help with, you know, job referrals or retaining. And then also, as I mentioned, certification. So we're, we're talking about certifications again, improving our skills and gaining certificates or gaining badges based upon our skills and showing that we are in specific skills. Then lastly, we have selection for training or transfer. So essentially, you may also be considered, you know, employment decisions if they lead to any of the decisions listed above. So people uh, really can be hired and fired based upon their results in an assessment. And it all leads back to this at the top. Data-driven decision-making is very important so that you can back up your actions. You can say you hired this person because they were fully competent and the proof is in their assessment score. You can say you hired sorry, you fired someone because they did not understand their job role, they were not competent, and the proof is in their low exam score, if that makes sense. So next, we understand the typical exam, you can have multiple choice questions, but what is an observational assessment, otherwise known as on the job? Now, essentially, these are assessments that can test employees' skills and abilities. So rather than, you know, really digging into knowledge, this is actually someone's ability to perform. So if, for example, we are in a medical lab, there may be a need for us to prove that we know how to use the specific equipment. So this happens a lot within healthcare. It happens a lot within um, the medical. For an observer or a professor to be able to rate the participant based on them conducting specific actions. So for example, the observer would have an eye with questions and they would conduct a task and make sure that they are doing everything correctly. So for example, we have a screenshot here, rate the participants execution of operating the task. So did they perform the task? They perform the task with prompting or were they unable to perform the task? 
So for example, an assessment online means you can create items to ratings, which means performing a task whilst using an online assessment results in objective ratings. It enforces consistent rating scales, which helps with the fairness of an assessment. You also would have strict scoring rubric, as everyone is scored in the same manner, even though you may have different observers conducting those on-the-job assessments. And then it also streamlines and centralizes the collection. So the collection of all of the results can be in one easy place to be to be analyzed to then conduct data-driven decisions. So on assessments are really important for some organizations. And what I've got here is a list of benefits. And essentially we have the ability to prove employee competency, to allow employees to be able to do skills, and then also to test beyond the knowledge to confirm that the skills can be applied. So really important to test and also be able to be observed showing those skills off. Task is to identify and tasks that would be needed in a job role. You can identify the conditions and identify what skills needed in a job role. So let's think about asking questions. How do you know what to look for in candidates? What skills do you need to look for? What is required from candidates? How can you spot skills gaps if you don't know what the skills are? Essentially, a job task analysis is a way of surveying the importance and frequency of specific actions within a job role. So what you can do is create a panel of experts that would describe the job. Of course, when you apply to a new job, you get a job description. You then also get a stakeholder to basically review this and then you get the ability to survey experts so on the next slide i'm going to show you an example you have you know what is your role within an organization and then you can answer questions about here nursing specifically how many times in a nursing job do you have to administer medication assess patients so really looking on the left, on the right, sorry, how difficult and how important are these tasks? And then we can see how often do you do this? What is the difficulty, et cetera. So this really helps you validate the content. After you case service, finish a job task analysis, you can look at the reports. So this really helps you to be able to understand how people feel about their job role. So this is a really interesting one type of assessment that not many people would think is a type, but it can be really important when creating a, a job description when you're wanting to hire a new member of staff, for example. Then we have the ability to decide what is a good test or not. So what makes a good test? Which as it states here, the degree to which evidence and theory support the interpretation of test scores for proposed uses of tests. Then you also need to know that a test content is reliable. So this includes the consistency of scores testing so time over time are people getting the correct incorrect etc and then fairness is huge specifically now you need to make sure that your tests are fair and that nobody is disadvantaged so example an example could be a 
not having an Arabic translator, for example, and you having to listen to everything in English, that affects your ability to understand the content. So if we were to create a test at the end of this, that we are testing you in Arabic, for example, if I was to give you an exam, which I'm not going to do, don't worry. Then we have test security. So this is basically all to do with the fraud, the cheating. Has someone helped me answer the question? Have I Googled the answer, etc.? Which means it's not an accurate reflection of my own ability. But you can see here it's really important when creating assessments to make sure they're reliable and valid. And as you can see, you can have some tests that are reliable but not valid, which means you know they're not hitting the bullseye, but they're in one specific area. Or you can have tests that are reliable and valid. They're hitting the bullseye, they are dependable, consistent, and they're accurately testing what they're meant to. So now we're going to have another quick poll. How do we know that we prepared a good assessment? So one second, I'll just launch the, the poll, our second last one. So how do we know that we prepared a good test? Do we allow someone to cheat? Is a good test one that just looks cool? Or is a good test a one that is valid and reliable? So, or even is, getting uh, higher uh, marks. <laughs> yes. Yes, and that's a, that's an interesting point as well because just because everyone scores well, it doesn't actually mean it's a good test because we could have made the questions too easy. Yeah, to collect more uh, marks. Yes. Uh -huh. So how do we know that we prepared a good test? Is it a good test if it looks cool? <laughs> Maybe it has some cool pictures on it. Is and it a I, Yeah, I guess I, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. I think this is oh. also uh, cultural oriented somehow. This is a little bit related to the culture and subculture uh, with all respect for all culture all over the world. But I think this is something very important to be considered. Definitely 100%, you know, and in line with that culture, you know, it's uh, it's really important that globally people aren't able to cheat and that, you know, globally a test is valid and reliable. And in order to make it valid and reliable, it has to be fair. And fairness is, uh, you know, can be differentiated in different parts of the globe. As I mentioned, you know, it's not fair if you don't give someone the ability to take a test in there natural language, shall we say. Totally agree with you, Chess. Yes. Perfect. So we're just going to go ahead and end this poll and I'll share the results. So well done. 78% of voters got this correct. So we know that we've prepared a good test if it is valid and reliable. That's really key. And as I mentioned with the dartboard slide earlier, uh, it's really important to know if a test is valid or reliable because it's definitely not a good test if anyone is able to cheat because we want to get the most accurate scores to be able to give the most accurate results. And then a test can't really be rated upon if it looks cool. <laughs> so essentially, you know, if we have some pictures and things, that could make it look cool, but realistically, that doesn't make it a, a valid and reliable good test. Perfect. Now, the last part of the, the webinar is really to focus on test fraud, risks and responses, and also to be able to vote upon the or be able to understand the different types of reports that can be taken as a result of an assessment. So is test fraud you will understand what cheating is basically cheating is where one or more test takers engage in activities to break the exam just to gain a high score so um, almost every testing will want to reduce you also have 
test theft, which is a form of fraud, and this space can also be known as content harvesting. It's where somebody steals the content of the test or they copy it and share it with other individuals. So, for example, the integrity because valid result if some and let's think about some examples of how fraud can manifest itself in real life. So as I mentioned, opening the questions in advance, which means you get an unfair advantage. You can receive expert help whilst test. So a friend could be on the phone, for example. You can use an offered aids like Googling the answers or using a proxy test taking which you could pay someone to take the test on your behalf. You could also try and tamper with the results of the test. Or you could try and copy answers from, you know, someone that's sitting next to you, for example. So there's a lot of risks that result from test fraud. So really, test fraud strengthens, uh, threatens, sorry, the reputation. Because if you're a university where everybody is cheating, people will not want to go to that university because they do not have highly esteemed degrees at the end of it. People will not take that university seriously, for example. And it devalues certifications. You know, if you're able to cheat, the hard work that has been put into it doesn't get shown at the end. It also can create a culture of cheating for everyone in other aspects. It can also have serious health and safety consequences. For example, if you went to a nurse and they you know, had to prescribe you some medicine, but they cheated on their test and they didn't know how to accurately prescribe medicine and they gave you too much of the medicine. This really can result in... I can tell it will be a disaster. Uh, yes. It's, it's be a disaster, yes. Definitely uh, nobody wants to receive, you know, incorrect dosages, etc. Yeah. And of course, it can, it can ruin L&D data. So if everybody's cheating on your corporate training program, you don't know who actually is able to do their job and who isn't. So, what is so managing tests requires that we can do so first. We can look at actions that deter text test fraud at the top there. So this might include having a written company policy in place that makes it clear that test fraud isn't tolerated. You can publicly make security messages, uh, sorry, make security measures known to employees. Uh, and then we have the ability to prevent. So actions that prevent test fraud might include having tests only accessible to a small number of administrators so that the content can't be leaked. You also could randomize the questions so that not each test taker receives the same questions so that they can't copy and they can't leak the questions. Then the ability to detect, so how to identify if tests are happening in your organization. You basically can you know, set up some analysis whistleblowers or maybe a tip line or you could use a proxy solution. So for example, question mark has an AI artificial intelligence proctoring tool which essentially monitors the student whilst they're taking the test and it records their behaviors and they are forced to share their screen, their video, their audio so that you're able to detect if any suspicious behaviors have taken place. And because as a test taker, they know that they recorded, they are less likely to cheat because they know that it will be presented as evidence. And then lastly, how do you respond? So what do you do if you find there has been test fraud? So for example, you retake the assessment, you could force people to retake the assessment. Um, or when they appeal, you can look at the reports of the assessment. 
Now, a key thing is types of different types of tests and should prevent because all tests, of course, are it effectively is understanding that not all test fraud is actually equally harmful. So you can see on the diagram here, um, this will help you to quantify the risk in a meaningful way, allowing you to place focus on situations of high probability and high impact, as opposed to low probability and low impact. So it really depends on the type of behaviors that are conducted. And that's what defines, you know, the severity of the cheating. So really, you want to prevent high probability and high impact cheating. And this is what you should focus on preventing. So if you know that everyone is able to Google the answer whilst they're taking an online test on their laptop, you should look at adding a lockdown browser for example, so that they can't open any other tabs, they can't Google the answer, they can't screenshot, etc. Whereas if there is something that happens on a less frequent basis and it doesn't impact the score that much, you don't need to focus on preventing at a higher measure. So basically that's essentially summarizing that there is lots of different ways to cheat and that there are measures to defer, to detect, to prevent, but not all types of cheating or types of behavior needs to be prevented. It all depends on high probability and high impact. One of our last polls and basically, I want you to explain what is an example of cheating. I'm going to go ahead and relaunch this. Uh, Chelsea, we have just only one and a half hours, so this uh, poll will take about five hours, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we're almost at the end. We've got one little section about reporting. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just kidding because it's a very interesting uh, question because as you see here, maybe I think they will exceed 80% uh, uh, or 90% for giving examples. Yes, and, and it's a really interesting question, you know, what is an example of cheating? If you were to take an ice cream into an exam room, is that an example of cheating? Or... If you need to wear reading glasses during an exam, is that an example of cheating? Or if you screenshot the questions and send them to your friends or co-workers, is that an example of cheating? So a little bit of an easy one here. So let's just see how well everyone's doing. Sometimes helping your colleagues next to your uh, uh, chair because he's suffering from something or illness. Do you think that this is cheating or just helping because he's supposed to have some problems? I think uh, if you allow me, just it's very, again, culture-wise uh, uh, questions because being yes. cheater, comparing being uh, smart or how, some sort of having this uh, way to getting the answer. So again, it's about the culture. Do you really know what cheating is or you just... Uh, thinking about this is uh, some sort of, uh, of ways to be smart uh, to pass the exam. It's something very important to, to, to define that in, in different contexts. Yes, that's a really great point that you mentioned, because, for example, when you mentioned about helping someone, you know, the provision of aid or support is that classified as cheating? So for example, if I have some reading disability and I need extra time, that should be support that is given to me to help with fairness, not seen as cheating. Or, you know, if I need a translator to help me with my exam, that is to aid fairness. So it's really a battle of 
you know, what makes it fair for other people so that everyone can be on a level paying ground when they are taking a test. That's a really important aspect as well. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Perfect. So I think we have almost everyone answered. Let's go ahead and share those results. So well done. Over 78% of people suggested that it is screenshotting the questions and sending to your friends before they take the test. So this relates to what I mentioned before with test fraud in terms of content harvesting. So this would give an advantage to your friends prior to taking the assessment in order to gain a higher score. So because we know exactly what's going to be tested, we would have a higher chance in gaining a higher score. Now, the other caveat to this is, you know, if you have conducted the correct training, you've conducted the correct research, you should be able to understand what would be the correct score. And that is what helps make a test fair. You know, we are using a test to be able to understand your abilities. So if you're not showing your abilities correctly, it's hard for us to accurately be able to understand how well you have taken on the learning. And I guess eating an ice cream is always fun. I wouldn't really want to do it whilst I'm whilst I'm taking a test. I'll maybe save it for after as a treat after the test. <laughs> yes. Perfect. So the last section now, just a few more slides. Uh, but really, arguably, the most important part is how to report on an assessment. If we take an assessment, you know, the data can just be floating out there. And it's really important to know what to do with those reports to create data-driven results or data-driven decision-making. Essentially, we want to generate reports that will deliver actionable insights for our organization. So with the foundation of reliable, secure, valid, and fair assessment practices, with skill-specific assessment types, whether it be knowledge assessment, observational assessments. You want to make sure they deliver trusted data insights so then you can make informed decisions for your organization. And like we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, decisions that you can make could be to hire, fire, promote, you know, lots of different decisions that can be made as a result of an assessment. So essentially, you want to be able to add more ROI to your learning and development, to your organization, add more return on investment to your learning and development program by improving employee performance engagement. You may want to pivot your training program to bridge skills gaps. So reports can help you understand where skills are lacking, understand specific skills such as strengths and weaknesses in specifics. You also will be able to complete regulatory compliance audit trails, which is really important for being able to prove that everyone has taken the test, etc. I want to highlight the, the types of reports that you can create. So for example, question mark automatically can generate reports after an assessment has been taken. Coaching reports are really important for individuals to understand feedback, to understand where they need to improve, to understand individually what they got right and wrong. You also need to be performing accurately. It relates to statistical analysis. And what I actually covered in my our last Academy is a question of accurately testing, etc. Are they too easy, too hard? So it's really an important to understand how accurate and valid your assessments are, which is what we mentioned earlier as well. 
Transcript reports can be used to track an individual's performance across multiple assessments. So for example, I can see, am I improving? Am I continuous achieving a high score? Or am I cons consistently achieving a low score, etc.? Then we have big picture reports. So we can see how organizations as a whole are performing. We could see, for example, how long people are spending on each question. Lots of different report types there. So I briefed the statistical analysis, and I'll not spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to show the types of reports and how you can prove that validity and reliability. So we mentioned that a good test is valid and reliable. How do we prove that? That would be via a statistical analysis report. So in a report such as an item analysis report, you can see, is the question accurate? Do you need to modify the question? Or do you need to look at the, the difficulty, et cetera? So on my screen here, you can see a diagram. And this is an example of in one test. And for example, like a traffic light system, everything in green is good and everything in yellow is cause for concern. So essentially, we want to look at maybe question one because it may not be performing well when it comes to item difficulty versus item total correlation discrimination. Now, what is item difficulty? So this is basically the percentage of answered questions correctly, whereas item correlation discrimination is the correlation between questions and answers. So how effectively the question differs between participants of different knowledge and skills, let's say comparing the high performers and performers. So it's really important this type of that you that, for example, you have four questions performing as well, and you may do more detail to see if you need to delete those questions from your test or by maybe looking at the amount of choices or distractors you're giving. So essentially, to, to summarize what we've covered, I've mentioned the role and the value and the process that assessments play in organizations and academic institutions. I've also mentioned what makes a good assessment, and that is an assessment that is valid and reliable. We've also mentioned some use cases and how assessments support all industries, whether it be manufacturing, oil and gas, pharmaceutical, IT, finance, transportation, higher education, and that they have a lot of use cases, whether it be for corporate training, compliance and regulation, certification, government, learning and development, etc. We've also looked at the types of assessments, tests, exams, quizzes, surveys, observational assessments, job task analysis assessments, formative, summative assessments. And then we've also looked at the types of test fraud. So what are examples of cheating? What are the risks of cheating? How do you respond to cheating in terms of detecting it? preventing it and deterring it. And then also that not all cheating has a high severity impact upon scores so that you don't need to spend time trying to deter all cheating behaviors. Then we've talked about the assessment process within L&D and how you can make data-driven decisions based upon assessment results and reports. So whether you hire people, fire people, whether you administer people to specific courses or universities, what's are really important to help you make those decisions and also to help you with your future and being able to, you know, decide the future of your assessments. Are they valid? Are they reliable? Are we able to prove this to management, et cetera? So a very high, high level webinar today. We haven't gone too deep into 
the weeds of, you know, the types of reports, etc. But essentially, I really hope that you, you know, can take away these key points and understand how assessments are important in the real world, how they impact multiple industries, types and examples, and how you yourself could create an assessment program, or how you yourself can deter cheating, or even improve upon your own assessments, or understand that when you take an assessment, I believe 73% of people had taken an online assessment, what can you do and what can you learn in terms of the feedback that you can get, understanding your strengths, weaknesses, etc. So thank you all so much for, for listening. I really appreciate your time and I hope you found it informative and learned a little bit more about assessments. And before we dig into the q and I just want to inform you that, you know, we have some links here, we share the slides on how you can improve your assessment journey. So please feel free to click these links. We always like to be knowledge sharing, and uh, I always want to help you with your assessment process in the, the best way possible. Perfect. So we'll make sure these are shared. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. It is really, really outstanding presentation, uh, full of information, uh, full of guidance, and as and also for, uh, full of uh, uh, tricks about thinking about the cheating, how it's uh, affecting the future of not just the organization, I think the country and the whole world. So it's not something personal. It's not something about uh, the attitude or behavior of the of the of the person or student he is or researcher or it, it's something um uh, digging in deep of the of the whole ethics of the of the community so uh you you present it in a very uh, light and at the same time deep way so uh, this is as we used to have you uh for, uh, have information from you so thank you so much it was very interesting one uh, and uh, as I used to do, just uh, trying to start with uh, what we call it warming up questions, which is like a appetizer. So uh, it's a bas very basic one about um, uh, how can we uh, reduce uh, uh, concern. This is from uh, Noor, by the way. How can we uh, reduce test uh, conformity over the year? And the second one is uh, how can uh, an organization ensure that tests are compliant with local and international standards? So uh, thank you, Noor, for this question. Yes, great, great question. So first, with regards to um, the test conformity. So essentially, um, it would be great to get an example of, of what you've been experiencing, Noor, but essentially, um, there are many ways to create tests that aren't exactly the same by avoiding previously delivered questions, by randomizing questions so that um, assessments are not able to be replicated amongst all test takers. Yeah. And sorry, can you repeat the, the question? Was it how can we stop the test conformity? Yes, yes, uh, along the years. And the second one is related about the international local standard. So uh, uh, how can the organization just ensure that tests are uh, complying with the local and international cell, aligned with it, I guess? Yes, that, that second point is a really great question in terms of aligning assessments with standards. So we have a lot of customers that have to, for example, in the aviation industry, they have to abide by civil aviation standards. And essentially, it's it's the way in which you set up the assessment. So it's finding a robust assessment tool that can help you to configure settings to match those specific requirements. And it's something that, for example, at Question Mark, we are willing to work with our clients, make sure you can tick the boxes and adhere to regulations. But for example, in the Aviation Authority, it's something we've done. In the IT industry, it's something we've done. And even in education practices, you know, working with universities to make sure that they are meeting the needs. It's it's really, there's not one specific answer, but it's basically working with a tool that can have robust capabilities to be able to tick those boxes. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question is about how do you see the technical difference between assessment and evaluation and how we can use it for evaluating or assessing, uh, if we can use both of terms, in training uh, methods? That's a really important question because, of course, we want to assess, obviously, the knowledge, skills and competencies, but we also want to potentially evaluate the actual skills that have been attained. And that's where, for example, you could utilize the observational assessment to be able to make sure that candidates can actually conduct specific tasks rather than just assessing the knowledge. You also could look at conducting surveys or providing comment boxes to your assessments to understand um, the thoughts of the test takers. And then lastly, you could look at using a, a job task analysis piece so that you can actually understand how often someone conducts specific roles and tasks, how difficult they find it, and the frequency that they would conduct those tasks. So essentially the overall answer is being able to create different types of assessments, which is great because you know there are many assessment tools that have the ability to create different types of assessments so that you can assess knowledge, but also evaluate someone's learning. And that can be by maybe more formative assessments where you're more frequently testing the knowledge rather than one um, summative assessment. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this telegraphic answer because we have flow of, <laughs> of uh, questions. Okay, um, uh, we need to get more elaboration about proctoring and how it's uh, helped in raising the validity of exam. Yeah, proctoring is a big one, and yes, I'll keep trying to answer these swiftly because it's great to see that you're asking many questions. Yeah. But proctoring really helps with being able to mitigate cheating by limiting the suspicious behavior that people can conduct. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have a record and review proctoring system that would monitor me throughout and it would use algorithms to detect suspicious behavior. So at the end, as a professor or a teacher, I can go in and I can see, has the person been looking elsewhere? Have they been trying to open another um, Google to Google the answers, etc.? So proctoring really helps to secure the exam environment as much as possible. Um, and then we can, you know, try and detect where suspicious behavior has taken place to then go ahead and pass or fail the candidate based upon their specific behaviors. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, I think this is in, okay. The next question, it's, uh, I guess this is the $1 million question. In your opinion, do you think that uh, relying on technologies like ChatGPT could be uh, considered as a cheating? This is a very interesting question because yeah, it relates the, to what you mentioned. There is another question yeah. related about AI. So also using AI in a way that helping the student, do you think that this is cheating as well? So it's very interesting because it's what you were mentioning earlier about, you know, is the person super smart that they're using all of the you know, features available to them to be able to attain the best scores. Um, mm -hmm. And the it really comes down to what is an assessment? Why are you taking an assessment? You're taking an assessment to evaluate your level of knowledge. So, you know, using ChatGBT or other um, frameworks, although it can help to enhance someone's knowledge and skills, at that point in time, it doesn't reflect upon their current level. So I'd say in day-to-day -day practice, AI can be really helpful when it comes to enhancing the way that you conduct your job, et cetera. But in terms of understanding your current level of knowledge, AI is not within your own brain. It's a separate <laughs> engine that can be utilized to grow your brain in the future, shall we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am totally agree with you, and I think um, uh, what we received from the AI and uh, one of the main things that ChatGPT and other things, I think it will be used in, in two ways. The way that 
uh, increase your uh, critical thinking and how you can see different angles for for the same uh, uh, topic. And at the same time, it could be something that you're relying on it, so you don't have this uh, creativity of thinking. Uh, I, I I think that the the coming days will will make it uh, more clear for us. Uh, this is question in Arabic. It's about the uh, the main uh, challenges that you think it's facing uh, this type of assessment, mainly the electronic for sure online. And, and I would say the the opposite to that to play devil's advocate is AI. So AI is a detriment to assessments because it does allow for people to be able to, um, you know, showcase their knowledge in a way that it's not own abilities. So it's a very it's a tool that can aid and support, but it also is very detrimental to the fact that, you know, as you mentioned, it could limit creativity, it could limit one's ambition to actually learn the content themselves. Um, and obviously, no one wants to solely rely on technology. So being able to input or enhance your own skills and knowledge is, is the key there. So I'd say one of the detriments is is AI because obviously it can be classed as a form of, of cheating. Yeah. Uh, okay. And um, how to raise the neutrality and objectivity in the following context, surveys in the academia and hiring in the organization? Yes. Yeah, so neutrality can also, we can also look at this as, you know, fairness. So being able to give everyone a level playing ground and being able to, you know, reduce bias. This can be in terms of gender, age, um, religion. It could be anything. So we basically just want to look solely at the knowledge and one person's skills and abilities that they can bring. So um, trying to have as least the least amount of demographics as possible and focus solely on someone's skills and abilities can really help with that. So that's where um, a knowledge assessment can really be helpful rather than, or a survey to understand one's opinions, to see how they would you know, react in your organizational culture, for example. Um, but it's a, really, it's a really key point and it's something that we do have to focus on more, but essentially trying to you know, reduce bias by limiting the or creating an anonymous, anonymous, anonymous um, let's say, uh, responses as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have to go back to ChatGPT because we have just received a question about it. So I think it's good to link it to it. Um, what is the way that we can prevent cheating using this uh, type of technology? <laughs> Great. Great question. So there's two quick responses to this. So yeah. you can prevent cheating of those that are trying to use ChatGPT in their assessment by locking down a browser or adding proctoring. So there's no way for them to copy and paste you. any yes. ChatGPTs. And then on the other side, um, you know, we can look at AI and as assistive technologies within the assessment space. So for example, at our organization, we are using AI to assist with the authoring. So when teachers and professors or trainers are creating their questions, we actually have a new feature where AI is used to formulate questions based upon a set of instructions that you can give it. So AI, let's say, isn't going anywhere and it's only, it's only getting bigger, isn't it? The hype is real. And essentially we need to look at how to utilize and leverage in a safe and ethical manner yeah absolutely so i do agree and if you uh, i can jump in on this one from my academic background and as a professor i think the way that the professor building his uh, exam or test uh, focusing on uh, showing up the, the personality of the student and push them just to give creative things coming from their own experience the more that he can do this in a way uh, very uh, uh, very smart, I think he reducing uh, using such uh, technology. Great point. Yeah. Uh, one more question. It's, um, okay. What should be Roblox to use uh, observation method of assessment? Yeah. So 
I think maybe he's just focusing about the, 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 the role of Robrex uh, to support the assessment. Yes, and this is a really great one because rubrics are basically, you know, a set of instructions that can be designed prior to so that you know how to rate someone's skills. Um, the This can be obviously manually created in a system. It can also be formulated based upon your own company policies, uh, procedures. So at the at the moment, it would be, you know, manually depicted in a software mm -hmm. um but you know you could create this as a checklist so you know let's keep it as simple as can you or can you not conduct the task do you or do you not know how to um conduct uh, a specific task so you can keep it uh, really high level but then offer the ability for comments as well um so that you can create a more streamlined rubrics um, to avoid bias, but also you can provide extra uh, information about how the person is conducting their skills. Perfect. Uh, related to that, there is a question about building the test and the instructor of personality could affect in some level on the assessment. Do you agree with that? So this is an interesting one, and I guess, yes, it could, but if you have a blueprint, if you have a test blueprint, that could... Um, you know, that's a set of instructions that professors have to follow when creating an assessment um, that could assist. But then also on the flip side, it is important that um, professors are able to be able to create content according to, let's say, um, content that they are providing anyway. So sometimes it is good to have um, that knowledge. But for example, if you wanted to avoid that, you could look at the more AI assistive technologies, like I mentioned with author aid at question mark, being able to ask the system to randomly generate questions based upon some rules that a professor has inputted as well. Yeah, and uh, I think the type of question as well, if it is an article question or this is bubble sheet thing, so this will be a uh, main factor to reduce the personal uh, factor. Okay. <laughs> We have said a good day for you. I want to know how cheating in tests can be minimized if not uh, putting into consideration the current technology. I think we already uh, touched this on it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay, there is an Arabic one, and I think it's very important. How to uh, uh, reduce the gap between the knowledge and skills or competences, uh, and how to uh, measure this uh, during the hiring or uh, studying uh, community? This is a really great question. And honestly, it's all to do with assessments. So being able to have different assessments that measure um, knowledge versus competency, um, and then looking at the reports. So being able to look at a report to understand one individual's strengths and weaknesses and where they can look at uh, topics for further learning that can really help within the hiring process because you can understand you know what specific skills are needed for a job role and then you can see what um, skills specifically people are proving that they have within an assessment you could also look at job task analysis in this because that would allow you to understand one person's thoughts upon their skills and abilities as well. Um, so self-assessment rather than just knowledge assessment is also really key in the hiring process. Um, I, I know that we are running out of time, so the, we are really apologize for the uh, attendees who sent uh, um, extra or no more questions. And we are welcoming to send this over the email. The last one that I need uh, your uh, input about it. Uh, how do you see the future of the assessment uh, within the technology for sure and within the uh, difference between countries? You know that this is also one uh, main factor if uh, we can think about this. Great question. That's a very big question. Um, let's let me uh, let me think here. So realistically i see assessments becoming a, a real forefront of every day-to-day -day life whether it be within your job roles or 
within um, the hiring process. And can you repeat the last part of the question, sorry? Yeah, it's about that. How do you see the future of this assessment within the technology and as well yeah. between difference between countries? Because you can't just put standard for all countries or all culture. Yeah, definitely. So one thing that I do foresee happening is I do see AI becoming a lot more integrated into the assessment process, whether it be like I mentioned with authoring the questions or using AI to prevent cheating. Lots of different ways that AI can be um, added. It can also be used for automatic marking of assessment questions. So I really think AI will become more incorporated in most assessment technologies. And then in terms of different countries, I I really foresee the focus on fairness and equity to become leveled up. And, you know, this can even be global certifications where different countries are unable to take the test because it's not in their local language. So using assistive technologies such as a translation management system, um, for example, Question Mark have a, an on-the-fly translation tool where even though I'm taking the test in English, my main lo local language may be Arabic. So I have a little uh, widget, an aid within the assessment that helps me to on-the-fly translate the content so that I'm able to understand the test and have a bit more of a fair and equal advantage when I'm taking the test. Um, I definitely foresee that. And then the last point is, you know, online assessments aren't fully onboarded globally. Uh, a lot of people still do use pen and paper testing, but with technology advancements and internet advancements, I do see, uh, I do foresee online technologies and online assessments becoming, uh, like I said, the forefront of, of most organizational practice. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, very informative answers, and I think uh, all attendees just need to get uh, more uh, information about this so they can uh, read about it and also uh, they can communicate us. Appreciate it so much, uh, Chelsea, and uh, we get your uh, word about having you again, uh, especially the attendees just uh, giving a very good impression about all the webinar that you serve. Uh, I do appreciate your uh, cooperation with Nasija Academy, and we always open our window to you to uh, uh, communicate with our attendees. My uh, thanks also for the attendees with their uh, uh, existence and also questions. So um, we would like to uh, confirm our appreciation for you, Chelsea, and I will leave the last word for you to um, say bye to our attendees and appreciate your cooperation again, please. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the ability to be able to conduct this webinar. I really appreciate the, the awareness and thank you all so much to the attendees for listening to me for the past hour and a half, for being so interactive and for, you know, conducting the, the polls and giving all of these questions. It really creates a great discussion and debate. So I really appreciate your time and your attendance and, and thank you all so much. And I hope to see you again on another one. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Chelsea. And we need to thank uh, uh, our translator, Mr. Salah. I think he did a great job and we are relying on him to uh, not translate wording, but translate also the concept. And he is uh, excellent in that. Thank you for my colleague, uh, Saeed. And thank you all our attendees uh, for following up Nasij Academy and attending. And uh, we uh, invite you to share all the knowledge that you received and also to attend the upcoming webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chelsea. Bye-bye.